But of course it's footy time, isn't it? Come on. Go the storms. Come on. Go the lions? Or? No, no, no. no. <laughs> yeah, they're gone. Yeah, they're gone, <laughs> right. Okay, so it's footy season and everybody knows. Well, it doesn't have to just be footy. It can be in all kinds of codes. Everybody knows about the sin bin. There's a sin bin. And, and someone that uh, uh, does the wrong thing gets put into the sin bin. Okay, now, you know, I want to start by saying first up, did anyone go to the sin bin last night? Did anyone watch it? <laughs> Did anyone go to the CFL? I mean, go to CFL. Did anyone go to the sin bin? Don't they? It's only in rugby, is it? In hockey and all, all that sort of stuff. So much do I know about AFL. Sorry, guys, for those who are into that. But anyway, the, the point is this. You go to the sin bin if you've transgressed. Now, the gospel, I want to say this, the gospel is good news. It's good news. It's absolutely good news. When I accepted Christ as my Saviour and Lord, it brought me freedom to live in such a way as to be a blessing to others, to my community and to myself. That's what the gospel does. When you accept it, it, it helps you to live this life well as well as prepare you for the future. And so when we dig into this today, we're looking at chapters 5 to 6 and it can be a little bit confronting. And some of those things that come out in that chapters 5 to 6 are a bit controversial. So uh, here we go. Sin bin, I looked it up in the, uh, in the dictionary. Here's a definition. Did you know it was in the dictionary? Well, it is. Now, here is a, one definition. The second definition will come out a little bit later. And it says this. It's a place for transgressors. An area where one is confined after or in order to avert a transgression. That's what the dictionary says about a sin bin. Okay, so if someone's transgressed, okay, or someone is about to get, lose his cool big time, so they put him, no, you go to the sin bin, you cool down a bit and then you'll get sorted. You know what I mean? It's that kind of thing. So that's what a sin bin is like. And so Paul is addressing a bunch of Christians that have gathered together. They come from all kinds of walks of life. Now, uh, you have to go back to some of the other uh, messages that we've had to see the kind of culture that it was. But he gives us a, an insight into what the congregation looked like. Now, it was not everybody like this, but chapter 6, this is what it says. It starts off like this. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor the slanderers, nor the swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that's what some of you were. Would you like to be part of a church where there's a, not everybody, but there's a, there's a, a considerable percentage of the people that at one time practice that lifestyle because the tense in this particular word is that they were they used to practice it but that's what they were not what they are it's what they were and so you get, get a picture of this in in some ways you know some people might say i don't want to have anything to do with a corinthian church but i tell you what i think i'd rather be there <laughs> why because at least it's the church that's reaching out. At least it's the church that's seeking to touch a community for Jesus Christ and to see lives changed. So I, I, I'm a, I quite like uh, uh, Corinthians for that particular purpose. Th that was, these were these people. So let's have a look at this. Remember, keep in your mind, they used to actively practice. So let's unpack some of these things. 
because I find that sometimes people don't connect with what it actually means. Sexually moral, that means that a person before marriage was sexually active, where there was one night stands. It's the, it's the culture that says, okay, can't wait for the weekend so I can get down to the pub or the nightclub or the, or the party or whatever it is, and I'm going to connect. Um, and probably stay the night. You know what I mean? It's that, it's that, that kind of thing. That, this is what sexually moral is talking about. It talks about idolatrous. That's, that is someone or something that you worship or that you idolise, that, 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 that just gets your attention all the time. Adulterers. Adulterers is a person who is married, who has sexual relations with someone other than their spouse. Just in case we don't, we don't get this. You know, I had one person say to me, a man, and he came to me and he said this. He says, uh, I am so highly sexed, I've got to have more than one woman. I've got to have more than one. I'm too highly sexed. That's the way God made me. He actually said that. That's the way God made me. That sounds familiar in some other circles today as well. No, you weren't just made that way. You were making choices. That's what an adulterer is. Men who have sex with men. That includes, in this context here, there was uh, uh, male prostitutes for temple worship. You've got to understand that in this city, there were these pagan temples, including one to Aphrodite. And that was the dominant one over the whole city. And Aphrodite was the, uh, the goddess of love. And so as part of their rituals, they entered into sexual activities. And males were involved uh, in that. So it included people had come out of that into this church that had been involved in that sort of thing. And as part of that, it also talks about this as young boys being groomed for sexual favours. That was happening in that city. It also talks about aggressive male to male a sexual behaviour. That's the meaning behind those words that they're trying to put together into English for us to understand. That's what it was like. But guess what? That's what some of these people were. They were thieves. They practiced thievery. They, they, uh, fraud was a big, a big deal in, in that society. Greed, riches at any price. Drunkards, where alcohol and other drugs that affected people's behaviour. You know, if you're in a high pressure kind of society, a high pressure business world, it's very easy to go to that sort of thing, to try to, to manage the pressure uh, that is on. But they got caught in that because of the addiction that goes along with it. Slanderers, people who were caught up in verbal abuse, language that was desire, uh, designed to be pulled down. Swindlers, people into extortion. That doesn't paint a very good picture in one sense. But you know what? That's what they were. You see, they couldn't find any hope in the world I can say that even if you've mixed with some of that sort of stuff, and you say, I've not touched hardly any of it, but, um, but maybe you've touched a little bit of it, guess what? The world can't offer you any hope. Because all the world can do is try to manage a little bit of the behaviour at the very best. Or it says, well, that's the way you are, and you'll just have to live with it. There's no hope. Where's the hope? The gospel is the gospel of hope. You can change. And that's why it says in verse 11, that's what some of you were. But you were washed. You were washed. You've been sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Think about that. Any one of us 
It doesn't matter what lifestyle you've been in. You may have lived a, a reasonably good lifestyle. But there'll be some things there that you know you wish you could have changed. When we come to Jesus Christ, whether you're in that category or whether you're in the category of a thief that, uh, that just earned their living by thievery, you still can change. God can do something. He can wash you. He can wash you. He can purify you and make you clean. I'm so glad about that. But not only that, he sanctifies you. He, 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 he gets you and he sets you apart and he makes you holy. That's what that word holy, sanctified and holy. You, you're being set apart and makes you holy. And what he has done, he, he, he got a hold of me and he says, John, I'm going to set you apart so that you can live the way you've been designed to live. Because that's what sanctification is. You see, the world can't offer you that. All the world says, oh, I'll put a few parameters around you and you just, uh, you're on your own. You're on your own. But Jesus comes into the scene, I'm going to sanctify you. Okay, I'm going to sanctify you. I'm going to bring you back to a place where you can begin to live out what you're designed to be. See, I wasn't designed to be a thief. I wasn't designed to be immoral. I wasn't designed to speak into people uh, and, and, and pull people down. I was designed for a better purpose than that. And so were you. And we get it by being born again of the Spirit of God. And then he goes on and it says, and you were justified. And that means that not only that, he, he sets me on this right path, but he justifies me so that I can stand before God just as if I'd never sinned. How cool is that? This is the message that comes out of the gospel here of, in, in Corinthians. And that leads me on, you see, because the gospel is about change and it's about giving me a, a new identity. My identity now is in Christ. Your identity now is in Christ. That is your position. And now my responsibility is to live the life of Christ out. That's my responsibility. And so this is where I stand. So what do we do then? We've got this new identity, but how do we help each other in, in, in working this through? Everybody, will everybody get the idea first up or do they have to learn? And then what do we do if things get a little bit out of hand? What happens when there's, a, when there's a move of God and a whole bunch of people start coming in from all different walks of life, how do we as the church community handle these sorts of things? And so Paul is writing to this church because they've already experienced it. And he writes to them and, and he says this in, in chapter 5, so we'll come back to that now. And he says this, I wrote you a, in my letter, this is in verses 9 to 10. He says, not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or greedy or swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave the world. So apparently, see, we've got two letters to Corinthians. Apparently there's about four. Uh, we've lost two of them. We don't know where they are. Or we don't know what... The, so, so we've only got two examples. But apparently he wrote an earlier letter and he was telling people to do this and he's trying to just spell it out a little bit better. He says, I'm not saying that you don't live in the world. You can't isolate yourself. You can't come back and, and, and go into hibernation somewhere. You've got to mix with people. Otherwise, how are you going to reach people for Jesus? See, you, you, you've got to mix with people. So he, he say, you're not saying that you can't, cannot isolate yourself from the world. But what do we do and what do you do when there's a gross practice of sin within the church family? How do we handle that kind of thing? As people come in, what happens? What are we going to do? Well, this is what Paul wrote. And he said this in verse 11. He says, but now I'm writing to you. He says, 
that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or a sister. In other words, who claims to be a full-on Christian, a brother or a sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy or idolatrous or a slanderer or a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with such people. And, 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 and so he's setting a, a standard here. And as I looked at this, I uh, focus on this word associate. What does it mean to be an associate? Well, you can have a business, you know, Joe Bloggs and Associates. Well, that's, that's one kind of meaning of it. But that word associate, according to the dictionary, means this, to bring into relation as a thought, feeling or memory. It also means to connect in mind or imagination. So what Paul is saying here, if I can just give a, a, a modern day illustration, say you're, you're a businessman and you go to a business lunch that has been organised by your, by your company. You go to that business lunch and you're doing business uh, deals or, or whatever, you are within the parameters of that company. Paul is not saying that you can't go to that. That's a business thing. It's got perimeters around it. But then somebody within that, within that business says, oh, well, why don't you come down to the pub with me? Now, this is the guy who says, oh, yeah, I believe in God. I believe in God. But he, but he invites you down to the pub, and you might go down to the pub, and you, and you may even make a decision, well, I'm not going to drink a beer or alcohol there, but I'll, I'll have a ginger beer or a Coke or something or other with him. But then you find something else. You find that as you begin to mix this guy who says that he is a Christian generally comes out the more that he drinks. You find the language is really beginning to change. You find he's starting to talk and do all sorts of things. You find, oh, this is getting a little bit uncomfortable here. What is happening? You're associating with him and now the thinking, his thinking is starting to get across into your thinking. You see what's happening? And Paul is saying, no, you can't do that. You, you, you can't do that. that that's, that's starting to go too far. This guy, so you're not going to that place to witness to him. You're going to that place and you're just associating with him. That's a different scenario. It's a different scenario. And you can get yourself sucked in. And Paul is saying, church, you're getting sucked in. Why were they getting sucked in? Well, you see... In this church, and you can read it to yourself in 1 Corinthians 5, 1 to 8, there was someone that came into the church. We don't know a lot about him, so some of the stuff I'm saying now is speculation. You know when I say it's speculation, it means it's an idea. Okay, it's not locked in there. It could be another, another angle to that whole thing. But someone had come into the church and he had a reputation this guy was actually having sexual relations with most Bible commentators say was his stepmother. And he was in the church. There's no mention of the stepmother, so she probably wasn't in the church. There's no mention of his father, it's just mentions of this guy. So let's paint a scenario of how it, perhaps it could have happened. He's someone, he's heard about this church, someone has been witnessing to him. He has come into the church and he said, yes, I, I really want to follow Jesus. And he's, and, he, and he's there every Sunday. He's participating in, in, the, in communion and in the service. And you know, of course, communion in those days was a full-on meal. It's a bit like what we, used to, we were having on Saturday nights with, with Pastor David, only it became a whole meal like that. That's the way they used to celebrate communion in, that, in those days. And so they're coming, he's coming into that and when he's there on the Sunday, he's got, he's got the right language, etc., etc. He's praising God, he's got his hands up. He Maybe even he's speaking in tongues. But his reputation is, everybody in the church knows, hey, he's sleeping with his, he's sleeping with his, with his stepmother. The world outside knows. Because it's a fair chance, and uh, because this church, 
was boasting that he was part of their church. So I put my thinking caps on and said, well, why are they boasting about it? Because Paul says you should be in grief. Why are you boasting? And I think because he was probably a well-to-do businessman. He probably had great influence in Corinth. And they're boasting about, look who we've got. We've got the politician. Or we've got this super-duper businessman that's come in. Well, he's come in and he may have been seeking after the Lord. He may have had those best of intentions. But something was disconnecting. He came in and he was there for the first week. And he was there for the first month. And he was there for three months. And I don't know how long the thing went on. But you know what I mean? He was there and he didn't connect that it's not appropriate to have a relationship with your stepmother. Even people outside of the church abhorred that in that era. That's what it's saying. The people who weren't believers said it's not right. But somehow he continued to live that particular lifestyle. Paul comes and he says to them, you've got to put him out. And in fact, he, 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 he says this, and he uses a word that's, uh, that's, that's pretty threatening, it seems, when you, when you hear it. He says, hand him over to Satan. What? Hand him... No, I did a bit of research on this too. That's a bit like a statement that you and I would make. It's a, it's a figure of speech. We might say, let him suffer the consequences of his actions. Let him suffer the consequences of his actions. Because see, what, what he was saying, he's going to get put out of the church. Okay, he's fair game. He's not going to have the covering. He's not going to have the support of the people. And so Paul says this to the church. And, and you say, well, wow, what do we do with that? Well, the church responded to Paul. And he, he got put out because he wouldn't change the lifestyle. Now, the thing is this, when Paul made that statement, he wouldn't know what the end result was going to be. Sometimes when you exercise self-love, uh, self-love, tough love, <laughs> just get the facts right here, tough love, you don't know what the action, the end action is going to be. But we do know with this one, because it's recorded in 2 Corinthians. And what it says is this, this guy, he had to learn the lesson, you've got to let go of that old lifestyle. And it says this in 2 Corinthians 7 to 8, talking about this same guy. Because you see, the church responded. He seen that, that, that he got put out. That means he couldn't come to the church until he got his lifestyle sorted out. And he didn't run away. Why didn't he run away? I'll tell you why he didn't run away. Because sometimes, if you're just demonstrating the love of Jesus to a person, sometimes discipline has to come in. But if that person knows that you still love them, you still love them, and you're going to support them, you're going to support them, you're going to do that. You see, this, this brings me to the other definition of what a sin bin is. Comes out of the dictionary, says this, a place that reassures that issues are being dealt with. So what was happening is, this guy was going, but he wasn't just being put out and not being looked after. He wasn't just being put out and said, well, well, you're absolutely on your own, that no one was going to contact him. He was put out and he, he began to think through the whole thing. And now we read it in 2 Corinthians, what Paul actually says to the church. Now that this guy is asking to come back, he's got his lifestyle sorted. And this is what he says. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. If something was to come up 
and you're dealing with somebody and they, they've come in and they've got this lifestyle and they, they haven't been able, able to shake it. <coughs> it's got to be a very gross type of thing. It's got to be something that's really big, that's, that's causing a great damage before you take this action. But even if we do have to take that action, that person needs to know, we love you. You know, we'll help you get yourself sorted. You know, we'll, we'll do what we can. We'll, 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 you know, put you in, in, in a program or something that's going to help you in that particular thing. We'll contact you occasionally, but, you know, until you can get a handle on this, we will help you however we can. You see, sometimes the church has to make some tough calls. But if we demonstrate it that way, then some of the people that we might call a prodigals that have walked away will be able to come back and know there's a church family that's going to love them. Yes, you may have been hurt. Sometimes the church family as a whole gets hurt by people's actions. Well, we forgive them. And we reassure them that as they come back, they are loved. That's what the Word of God's talking about. So, we've got to make some tough calls. So as we go through this, this, this passage, we find this, that uh, Paul says to the church, Come on, guys, it's time to rise up. Come on, get with it. Be the strong church that you can be in the place, that has strong love, you know, that can reach into all kinds of different people. And he says this, come on, rise up, you know, put, uh, get some strength into you. And he makes this statement, he says, don't you know in verse 2 of chapter 6 that you're going to judge the world hang on we're not supposed to be judging is is that correct but what Paul is talking about here is that time probably in the if you get into second coming and all that sort of thing, a thousand year reign or that that time of thing but it, it indicates from the word of God that we the church will be judging the world at some point And and he's leading into this. He said, you've got to make some tough calls at times. Don't you know that you're going to judge the world? He goes on even further in verse 3 and he says, don't you know you're even going to judge angels? Whoa, what? You mean I'm going to judge this 10-foot dude? You know, he'll knock me out. You know why? Because an angel is a servant of the king. You and I are sons and daughters of the king. That's why. That's why. And so, he says, come on church, get your act together. This is paraphrasing here, of course. And he says, and why in the midst of this? It's like he he moves on, he says, why in the midst of this are Christians taking Christians to law courts? Why are you doing it? He says, in some of these trivial matters, it was probably over property or it was probably over some business transaction or whatever it is because it was a a port city with a lot of business and that going on. He says, why are you taking your fellow believer to court? And he says this in verse 7. He says, the very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you've been completely defeated already if you've got to do that if you can't work this out between yourselves why are you putting it in the hands of unbelievers he says you've been defeated already and he actually says this why not rather be wronged why not rather be cheated why not just let it go well I can tell you in in today's society you take someone to court You better have some dollars. You better have some dollars. I think the word of God is very alive. Isn't it? Okay. He goes on and and so he he emphasizes this and he makes this statement which just stood out to me. And we'll finish with this. He says this. 
in verse 12. But I will not be mastered by anything. Who's running the show? Who's running the show in your life? Paul makes a quote, an everyday quote that was going around at the time, and he says, it's food for the stomach and stomach for the food. In other words, I live to eat and I eat to live. It's just a saying that was going around at the time. We may have some similar type sayings like that. But what he was getting at, and he begins to go on, he begins to talk about our bodies. Do you know your body is important? It was very important in the Corinthian context because they were influenced by Greek thinking and Greek thinking said you either had the body beautiful but it didn't matter what you did with it. You know, you had the perfect body but it didn't matter what you did with that perfect body. They had this kind of disconnect that was going on there. And so Paul is, is trying to emphasise something. He says, yes, your bodies are important. But do you master it or does it master you? That's the question. Who, who, who's mastering this? Who, who's the boss in this situation? Okay. They <coughs> and so there's a challenge that comes to us. Because Paul ends up saying this, don't you know, in verse 15, that your bodies are members of Christ himself. Radical decision. What I've accepted Jesus as my saviour, I'm born again of the spirit of God, I've got his Holy Spirit, and now you're saying to me, yes, you'll join yourself with Christ. That's why he says you're in Christ. You're in Christ. Your bodies are members of Christ himself. So it raises the question then, what do I do with this body? What you put into your body should help and not hinder it. The food that we put into our body, okay? Going on a health kick, that, that's good. The food that you put into your body shouldn't be there to hinder it. It should be good for you. And so it just, it's, it's, it's basic common sense, but let's, let's eat good food, not rubbish food. The drink that you put into your body. Guys, if you go over whatever it is of, of, of alcohol, you're doing damage to your body. It's only a very small amount before, before you, it's doing damage. You see, what are the things that we put into the body? The medication that we, we may choose to take. There's a reason why you only take X amount of medication because it can do damage to your body. It may help with this bit, but it'll do damage. We understand those things. All the various things that are around us in life. What are we putting into it? What we smoke? What are we putting into our body? The Word of God said, don't you know that your bodies are the members of Christ himself? What, how I use my body? See, we're called to use our body for the benefit of others, not just for our own benefit. That's the teaching that comes out of the Word of God. Sometimes we don't think about it that way, but it, yes, it is. You know, I use my body, not just my, just not my spirit, but, you know, my body holds everything within. I use it. Those people that... That the fight the bushfires. Just you see some of those those programs of what how those the firefighters went in to those uh, particular areas of firefighting. What happened with that? They were using their bodies were on the line. They were using their bodies for the benefit of somebody else, and you can equate that in all kinds of different areas. Paul, this is what Paul is talking about: how I use my body to benefit others. But then he says, it's not being given to you to be used in sexual immorality. You don't go going to a prostitute. You don't go doing going down that track. You use your body for God honouring things. And he finishes by saying this very thing. Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your body. Our body. 
The temple of the Holy Spirit is to be looked after. And you know what? We have been bought. We're not our own. When we give our lives to Christ, you've given your life to Christ. You're not your own. Okay. You've been bought with a price, a price that has been paid, that price of Jesus Christ dying on that cross for you and for me. You have been bought with a price. Therefore, honour God with your body. We're going to have uh, a song come up in a moment and as that's being played, we're going to pray and uh, maybe today the Lord has spoken to you about something you need some prayer support. I would suggest today that even at the start of this where, you, where, where some of those things are listed in relation to the various behaviours that were in that church, maybe that's something you've known in the past and every so often it keeps coming back. I'll be happy to pray with you to see that thing cut off. Let it be cut off. It shouldn't be coming back into your life. Let it be cut off. And I'll be happy to pray with you. And there may be other areas. Prayers for healing. We can anoint you with oil. Other things as this music is being played. So Father, confirm your word in each one. See you today. And as we worship you, Lord, I pray that you'll give people the strength that need prayer today to come forward so we can stand with them. Lord, just do your will. Have your way, we pray. In Jesus' name. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you We live for you Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder And show me who you are and fit Come on.